Good morning, everyone. It's great to see all of you here this morning. I just want to say one thing about um, yesterday's tornadoes, etc. cetera. Um, I was told by my wife, uh, who obviously, her sister, brother-in-law, live in Bowling Green. It was hit very bad, very bad. The, uh, the entire city is you know, just debris everywhere. So that church is the church I went to when I was a college student there. I know a lot of those people. I go back and visit family there. I see people there, people who have cared for me in years past. So it, it was hard to hear about the devastation, but mostly what I was concerned about is everyone safe. Are they, are they all safe? And then I hear this story that one family, a woman whom my daughter worked with while she was in Bowling Green, her husband and her children went into a safe room when the tornado came. And the tornado completely took apart their house while they were in that room. They listened while their house was being disintegrated. And I thought, well, thank God they are safe. But I also saw a spiritual value to that story. <coughs> this world is like a tornado. And we have been called by his son and given safety in him. No matter if we lose our health, no matter if we lose everything that we have, that does not matter so long as our souls are safe in the arms of Jesus. And that is the most beautiful thing I could find from that story yesterday, that they were safe, and we are safe from what this world throws at us. So we are in the fifth letter of the seven letters that were given to the churches in Asia. And this letter is going to a city and a church in Sardis. And I, I, I want you to know, and maybe you've been thinking the same thing, that even though you've heard lessons on Revelation 2 and 3 before, and even though you've studied these before, I'm, I'm going to admit to you that at 70 years old, I've never been so impressed by what Jesus has said. I, I've never been so taken aback by his piercing and soul-searching words. Jesus knows every church of his completely and utterly. Jesus knows the Canyon Church in the same way. Some of these churches were being persecuted heavily and had lost members to martyrdom. But did you notice that if Jesus was going to call them to change, he did not diminish his call to change and repent at all because of their persecution. I hope, my hope and my goal is that I'm living up to those kinds of messages that I'm bringing to you. So let's begin by looking at a little background of this city, Sardis, as we have with the others. The history of Sardis, very much unlike Thyatira, is a checkered one. Sardis was the capital of a kingdom called Lydia. And we don't study too much about Lydia in schools like we might about the Greek Empire, the Romans, etc. But their kingdom went on three times and more longer than what the United States has so far. That kingdom started in 1200 B.C. and did not end until 546 B.C. when Cyrus the Great 
conquered it for the Persian Empire. Sardis was its capital. And it sat in a very unusual place because there was a high up kind of valley at the bottom of this steep, steep cliff. And on the top of that cliff, on the top of that citadel, they created their Acropolis, their fortress. So anytime they were under siege, all of the army, the royalty, and everyone else could go up and be safe up there, they thought. Well, this Acropolis was on this hill right here in Sardis. So when you come up to the ancient city of Sardis, you see this high, high hill. And as you can see, some of the ruins on that hill. Sardis was famous for its lavish wealth the minting of the first coins in the history of man. They used silver for the most part. And also, it was known for a legendary king named Croesus, who was the last king of Sardis uh, when the Persians came. The story is told by the Greek historian Herodotus that when the Persians arrived, the Lydian army retreated up into the citadel. And they basically thought, there's no way the Persians can get to us. However, Cyrus told his men, if there's anyone here who can figure out a way to take this city and citadel, I will make sure this person is wealthy for the rest of their lives. So as soldiers were watching, one of the soldiers noticed this that one of the Lydian defenders lost his helmet over the wall at the top of the citadel. And it just kind of bounced down the cliff. And so he waited and waited and waited. And sometime later, that defender appeared at the bottom, gathered his helmet, and went back up. There was a secret pass. The Persians found it, and that very night, they went up and found the army asleep. No guards at all. They opened the gate, and they took the city. Pretty shocking. That's, uh, that's interesting, I think. An interesting story. Is it, is it somewhat legendized? by Herodotus? I don't know. Historians had a way of doing that. But that is, I think, something that happened in some way or another that the, the people of Sardis knew their history that way. Well, Sardis was rebuilt by the Greeks after Alexander's conquest in the 300s BC. Uh, here's a picture of the gymnasium, and you might say, whoa, that is quite a ruin to have, you know, held up all these thousands of years. Uh, uh, let me tell you this. The first time I saw it, I thought the same thing that I found out that Cornell and Harvard students go there and they're carefully reconstructing the gymnasium and the bath of Cyrus in order to give people the idea of what it actually looked like when it, it was built. Um, also, the city of Sardis had a temple to Artemis, just like Ephesus did. Uh, we have the ruins of that. But what is interesting about the city of Sardis is that they, they worshipped an un, kind of a not very well-known goddess. I had never heard of her before, but she is called the mother goddess. Her name is Cybele, and she is a despicable goddess, I'd have to say. The worshipers that came to Cybele's temple were not allowed to walk in unless they were dressed in white, white robes. Now that's going to come into play later on. And so uh, the immoral acts, however, 
by people who came into this temple uh, with these white robes. And the circumstances surrounding this idol, this goddess, are so degrading and so bad, I'm not even comfortable mentioning them here. They fall under the canopy of what I would say in Ephesians, the fifth chapter and verse 12, where Paul says, for it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which they do in secret. That's how bad it was. And that city was proud to have her temple there. All right, let's read the letter to the church at Sardis. Chapter three of Revelation, verses one through six. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, he who, has the, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches." So Jesus begins by identifying himself to the church of Sardis as the one who has the seven spirits. We, we've noticed this before, and I, I just believe that means he has the full measure of the Holy Spirit whom he can send at his bidding to do his work. Seven is the number that is complete, okay? And he also holds the seven churches in his right hand, or he holds the angels or messengers to the churches in his right hand. And you might be saying, well, does Canyon have an angel over it? I believe so. I believe that what's, that's what it says. Not only has a lampstand in heaven among which Jesus walks, it also has an angel watching over. I mean, children have angels that stand before God and plead their case if they're not being treated right. We find that in the Gospels. So, so I, I, I think we haven't done enough study on angels, by the way. But at, at, at any rate, I, I want you to know that I believe this means Jesus holds the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit in the churches, and he also is the fullness of the churches. As it says in Ephesians 1, and 23, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, as in every letter, Jesus starts out with, I know. I know what's going on. So he knows three things. Number one, he knows their deeds. Number two, he knows their reputation. He, he says, I know you have a reputation that you're alive. But number three, you're dead. I know you're dead. Wow, that is a heavy rebuke. And I think, in my mind, the fact that this church had that kind of reputation among the other churches, maybe among the other six in this circuit, they were all thinking Sardis is a thriving church. Well, I wonder sometimes if the statement of Jesus shocked them all. I've often uh, thought, that if a letter like this came to one of the American churches and one of its pastors got up and said, I, I need to read a letter from Jesus to you. <laughs> and it starts off by saying, I know your deeds. I know you think you're alive, but you're dead. And there are gasps in the pews and a few elderly ladies fan themselves to try to get their breath. You know, it's like, huh? What? Us? 
Are you kidding? A good reputation is always a good thing to have. Solomon says that. But if there is no substance to it, it smacks of Phariseeism. Jesus called the Pharisees, quote, white-washed tombed. Tombs. He said, you decorate the outside of the tombs of these people, you know, and, and make it look beautiful. But inside, you are dead men's bones. You're dead spiritually to God. Jesus saw right through what many could not see through with the Pharisees, and he saw right through the shallow reputation of this church. Now go to verses two and three again. So what is his prescription? He immediately says to them, wake up. Wake up. Be alert, your translation may say. In the actual Greek, it is the words that a commander would give to a soldier who is guarding the wall. Stay alert. Wake up. Do not fall asleep. And it harkens back to what happened to them in 546 BC. They were asleep and their city was taken because they were not awake. They had this sense of total safety. He says the second thing that he wants them to do is strengthen the things that remain which are about to die. Now, that tells me that there were some deeds that they were doing, but in Jesus's mind, they were sickly, they were impotent, they didn't bring about results, and they needed to be resuscitated. These were, these were the deeds that were not complete, as he says, they were not full, they were not finished in his sight. And he gives them a prescription for revival, for any dead church. As Kirk was saying today, the father is always waiting, so to speak, on the porch to see someone repent, change their life, come back to him. And so he says, remember what you have received and heard, keep it and repent. Well, what was, what was it that they had received? What was it that they had heard? Well, it was the powerful gospel of Jesus Christ that changed their lives in the beginning. First John, the second chapter, verse 24 says, as for you, let that abide in you, which you have heard from the beginning. If what you have heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. Brothers and sisters, I have said this before, and I don't want you to ever think that I wouldn't say it again. You cannot be alive in Christ unless you are receiving and eating, imbibing, whatever you want to call it, his word. It's impossible for you to be alive and not be connected to the word because that's the bread of life. He is the living word and we have to eat him according to John the sixth chapter. And as much as a lot of people were turned off by that statement in John six, when he said that on the mountain, he said it proudly. You must eat my flesh and drink my blood and you cannot be alive without the word. So the first thing he says to this dead church to resuscitate them is go back to what you received and heard. Keep it, hold on to it, and then change. It's like what Paul said in Ephesians, the fifth chapter in verse 14, awake sleeper and arise from the dead and Christ will shine upon you. Now look down to verse four. Verse four is the only compliment that Jesus gives this church, but it is a power-packed one, I do believe. You have some, he calls them a few, quote, unquote, who are not like the rest because they are worthy. I thought that, I, I, you know, when I saw that word worthy, I kind of looked back and I, I thought of a passage and, 
in the New Testament where the servant says, you know, we're not worthy. We're all unworthy. You know, we're just unworthy servants. And that's true. In our innate being, we are unworthy. It is by God's grace that any of us would ever be saved. We're never saved by an earning. However, there is a way we can walk worthily of the gospel. There is a way that we can be, in a sense, worthy of the calling that we have. That is stated in Ephesians, the fourth chapter and verse one, when he says, I call you to walk worthily in the manner that you have been called by God. Whatever you received in the beginning, whatever you heard in the beginning that changed your life, that made you all of a sudden wake up and begin to realize that you were headed in a direction of destruction, that word needs to be motivating to you that word needs to be animating you. That word that was given by the Holy Spirit is given so that you can not only live in Christ Jesus, but your very being, your very walk, your life is going to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. It's interesting to me, and I think it's an important statement of Jesus when he says, these people will walk with me in white. I think that harkens back to the ironic type of laws, whatever they were, mandates by Cybele, the goddess, that says you don't approach my temple without wearing white robes. Well, these are the people who really do walk in white. But it also says this, that the disciple of Christ will not be judged by the corporate church of which they are a part. They're not going to be judged by the community. So if you find yourself one day in a really, really thriving, alive church, don't think for a moment, well, I'm going with them. Unless you are with them, thriving and alive. And if you find yourself one day in a church that you look around and you go, am I the only one working here? Am I the only one doing anything here? Well, don't think for a moment that you're going to be judged harshly by God when you are walking in white. Verses 5 and 6, Jesus repeats his promise that the overcomers will be clothed in white garments. And if you turn one page in your Bible, the way it is in mine, chapter 7 and verse 9 says this, and these people, remember, are going to hear the rest of Revelation after they hear the beginning of it. They're just not getting the letter. They're getting the whole Revelation. The letter is included just like it is in our Bibles, okay? So they're going to see this later on. Those few in Sardis are going to see chapter 7, verse 9. After these things I looked, John said, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice, saying, and we sing the song sometimes, salvation be to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Wow. That, that's beautiful. So he repeats that promise. Jesus also states that he will not erase or blot out their names. I didn't know this before I began studying this, but Greeks would do that. There was a person who was in charge of the city register. And in order to, you know, make sure that they had a correct accounting of how many were in that city, when a person would die, they would go to the register, which had every name of the citizen living in that city, and they would blot out or erase that name. And Jesus is saying, I'm not erasing your name. I'm not blotting it out. You're going to live forever. Dead people, however, do not remain on the book of life. And that's important to understand. Dead people 
are not on Jesus's book of life. Finally, the third promise of Jesus to overcomers is truly amazing. I will confess these names of the people before my Father God and his angels. I, I, sometimes I have to recognize that when something sounds so foreign to me, I don't know what it's like to have somebody confess my name before some majestic person. <laughs> I, I, I don't live in a kingdom. I doubt if I did live in a kingdom, somebody would confess my name to the king. And yet, that's what Jesus says. I'll confess it. Now, Jesus is the king of truth. He only speaks truth. So when he confesses our names before the Father God, he's speaking truth. As much as that might just blow your mind, he's going to do that. that is a, that's an amazing message. So what do we learn from Sardis? What can we learn from this church? And I struggled with coming up with one takeaway. I'm trying to do that with every church, and I struggled with this one. But the message I believe from Sardis is real spiritual life in a church only happens when it is filled with the Holy Spirit, because it's the Holy Spirit that animates a church. It's the Holy Spirit that animated the church in Jerusalem. And it's the Holy Spirit that wants to animate every church. And if the Holy Spirit is not moving and shaking in that church, it's because the people have said, hmm, stay away. And as Kirk said today, there's no way the Father, if we decide to stay away from him, is going to go running, you know, and put some sort of hook in the back of our neck and drag us right back in. That's not happening. That's not our God. Real life in a church only happens when it's filled with the Holy Spirit. Sardis had this outwardly strong reputation, but inwardly lacked the power of the Holy Spirit in the lives of its members. And, and you know what? I think a lot of churches might do that. They busy themselves with a lot of ministries, and we have to make sure that we don't do that. Crank out a whole bunch of inward activity and make a name for themselves on social media and other platforms with flashy services, but when it comes down to what really makes a church alive, they fall miserably short. Any church can do that. Did the church at Sardis tolerate false teachers? Were they, was there immorality among the members? Did they commit sacrilege to idols? I can't find that any place here. Doesn't say any of that in this letter. Sardis is the quintessential example of a church that is nominally Christian in name only. There is no way in my mind that Sardis could have been called dead if they were a church that was winning genuine souls who were growing in their love and devotion for God. That's a function of the Holy Spirit in a church. That's the primary mission of the church. But Jesus found none of their works completed. I read something by an author I don't even remember the name. Sorry about that. That's happens to me. I, I thought I thought I'll remember that name and not write it down. I have not. But what he said was really good. He says, "You'll know if the church is alive because the people will be talking about what the Holy Spirit is doing in their lives, and you'll begin to see it. <laughs> what the Holy Spirit does in the life of a church, it is going to be noticeable." He doesn't do it in secret. And so if we want to see more acts of the Holy Spirit, allow him to work in you. To the point where you are calling upon him, take me, Lord, to the next level of service. <clears throat> Did you notice that Jesus doesn't talk about any persecution of this church. No Jews getting together with the Romans are really, you know, 
making their lives miserable. I thought about that for a while, and I thought, why? Why would Satan persecute a church that was dead? It's no threat to him whatsoever. That's quite interesting. I want to end by reading two scriptures to you. I put them up on the board so you don't even have to go to them. They're both about the church at Thessalonica. We hear a lot of bad things about those Thessalonians. You know, those, it's the Jews. It wasn't the church. <laughs> he doesn't say bad things, you know, about the church in Thessalonica, about the people who did believe. He's talking about the Jews who refused to search the scriptures daily like the Berean Jews in their synagogue did. Okay, but notice what Paul says about this church in the first chapter of his first letter, and then I will read what Paul says about this church again years later in the first chapter of the second letter. We always give thanks to God for all of you making mention of you in our prayers, constantly keeping in mind your work of faith, your labor of love and perseverance of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ and the presence of our God and Father, knowing brothers and sisters beloved by God, his choice of you. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sakes. You also become, became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word during great affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. I'm going to stop right there. The Thessalonian reputation was worthy. They did have a reputation, but everybody knew it was that you know it was proven by what they did as an example to everybody in Macedonia and Achaia. That's down there at the church in Athens, that's down there in the church of Corinth, and that's up there in Philippi. They're knowing about the Thessalonians. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place the news of your faith toward God has gone out so that we have no need to say anything. The second one, 2 Thessalonians 1, 3 through 5. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, as it is only fitting because your faith is increasing abundantly and the love of each and every one of you toward one another grows even greater. As a result, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the other churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you indeed are suffering. That's a church that is obviously alive. This is the kind of church we must be. Let's pray together. Our holy and gracious Father, help us to be a church that is willing and ready to repent of whatever you have called us to change. Help us to be full of people who have invited the Holy Spirit into their lives and are challenging themselves to increase and always abound in the work of your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to be a church who continually feeds upon your word, not just once a week in a Bible class, but, but always and regularly, continually feeding. You know, Father, that we need this to be spiritually alive. We pray, Father, that we would be walking worthily of the calling of the gospel that we received and that we should hold on to 
and that we should share in our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Have a great week in the Lord, everyone. Yes.